Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. It's been a decade since Hugo Chavez was first sworn in as president of Venezuela. In those 10 years, the poor have held him as a hero, and the affluent have denounced him as an autocrat. Whichever the case, the U.S. may have to contend with him for a long time to come. Chavez recently won a referendum allowing him to run for re-election indefinitely. On this edition of Independent Sources, we talk with two Latin America experts about the impact Chavez has on the region and the possibility of a thaw in the Chile relationship between the U.S. and Venezuela. We look at a different take on how immigrants are weathering the financial storm. And we meet a Zimbabwean immigrant bringing his audience news and views from Africa via Internet radio. But first, Venezuela under President Hugo Chavez what that means for Latin America and for U.S. foreign policy. Joining me to discuss these issues is Christy Thornton, director of the North American Congress on Latin America, or NACLA. Also here, journalist Clara Ponce de Leon, who is writing a book about President Obama and the new left in Latin America. Welcome. Hugo Chavez last month uh, finally won what he wanted, which was to do away with term limit. Mm -hmm. He tried once before and he failed. Mm -hmm. How was he able to do that this time, Christy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the important ways was that the last time that term limits came up for a referendum, which was in December of 2007, it was part of a package of more than 65 different changes to the Constitution. And so I think that a lot of people in Venezuela were were concerned that there were too many changes and that they didn't understand all of them. Everybody knew that there was this one important one about ending the term limits, but it was part of these broader changes. So this time, you know, they sort of cut through it and said, term limits is what this referendum is about. And so that's why you saw the decisive victory that Chavez was It was, was about able. 64, what was the percentage? It was 55 50, to 45, 50, basically, yeah. is how it broke out, with about 70 percent turnout. Okay. Clara. You know, yes. Chavez has been undergoing quickly, he has made no bones about it, his socialist tendencies. Recently, he threatened and he did uh, take over the rice industry in Venezuela. What do you think, what do you see this going internally and externally? No, I, I think he has, he's very popular. I mean, that he's not uh, losing any election. And uh, I think, you know, the last, uh, I mean, that he was he, the endless uh, re-election shows that he's sort of plebiscite of his mandate. Mm -hmm. I think he has lots of support mm -hmm. and uh, he's doing lots of good things for Latin America, I must say. Give us some example of what he's doing outside of Venezuela in Latin America. I know that he's involved in providing oil for inexpensive or cheap prices to Caribbean and other Latin American countries. What else is he doing? No, the thing is the movement is also with Lula of Brazil, is integration. Mm -hmm. The integration, the, the South American mainly, now that the, uh, the Lula convened a uh, summit of the whole Latin America was very good. But how the, the uh, organs that already created are South America. Okay, and, and, uh, and Chavez and Lula are doing fantastic in that sense. And uh, besides that, I think what uh, Chavez did, you know, to lend money to the countries to pay their foreign debt, mm -hmm. that was excellent. Yeah, yes. The way that you know to retire, I mean, to de in get more independent from the U.S., from the World Bank, and from the international. So he's also, he's also been providing financial assistance Absolutely, to these yes, countries. Absolutely, yes. Well, and it's and it goes beyond that as well. It goes beyond sort of financial and market assistance. It's beyond market integration in something like Mercosur absolutely. to the sort of uh, political integration in something like Unasur, the Association of South American States. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have really been able to sort of come together politically and provide supports support in moments of crisis when it's been necessary. Now. Venice, the oil prices, I don't know, no, no, they fluctuate this week. It's for, around $44, $45. Mm -hmm. Can he continue to be so generous with dwindling revenues from oil, which well, is his main right. source of income, yeah, right? Not in the long term. And that's, that's the big problem, obviously, right now that's haunting Chavez. You know, uh, government spending on social services has tripled since um, since the sort of socialist consolidation started to happen in 2003 after the general strike and the after the coup, mm -hmm. and so you've seen that <clears throat> you've seen that spending triple. And so to maintain that level of spending, it's really been um, it's been completely dependent on oil export exports. 
Um, so I think with the oil prices as low as they are, Venezuela can continue at the level, but for a short period of time, for not more than a year. Now, there aren't a lot of economists who think that uh, oil prices are going to stay this low. They're going to stay in the 40s. People think they're going to go back up to the 60s. And so obviously that's not the highs that it was. But Venezuela does have some foreign reserves that it can use to sort of get it through these, this crisis. What do you think, Clara? And if he doesn't have those resources available to him, what does he do then? Well, I don't think that, he, that his plan to disappear at all, because you know the, he's, uh, I mean, what Chavez is doing in Latin America has a lot of support. So of course, you know, the Venezuelan money and what he was, he was offering was very important, but I don't think that it, the, because of the price of the oil will go down, that will be uh, finished at all. I don't think so at all. But I think it's important. There are important questions about um, Venezuela diversifying its economy. If mm -hmm. if lifting the term limits means keeping Chavez on and, and continuing the Bolivarian Revolution, if he wins the next election, which is still yet he has, still has to do, then Venezuela's real challenge is to really diversify its economy and not be so dependent on those oil revenues for its socialist project. Clara, you've been researching Chavez for your book. What are you going to say about him? What are you finding out so far? He's not, is it a caricature that uh, the, the mainstream press portrays sometimes, or is he a much more complex person and with views that are uh, much more sophisticated than we give him credit for here? No, I think, I think he has very clear what he wanted, and uh, he has a lot of appeal, not only from Venezuela, from the other, I mean, for the people of other countries. Even the, I read the, in the American press, you know, that uh, even New York Times, Surprise at the moment, how he was he was as a way replacing Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. You know that the that the enthusiasm for him was really very very clear and very strong. What's his appeal? I mean, what does he say? Uh, what does he talk to? Who is he talking to? That people are galvanizing around him. Well, I think you know the question that he's so much against the United States is very appealing to, for many. But mm -hmm. I also think that there is a there is a way in which he. People in Venezuela feel as though people who have traditionally been excluded from the sorts of normal channels of power feel very much empowered by the Chavez government, by the way in which it's organized, and by their their sort of interactions in local politics. And so I think, to a large extent, there are, there is a whole class of people in Venezuela who traditionally been excluded from politics who now feel included, and that's why you see something like a 55 percent majority to allow him to end the term limits. This is a country of 28 million people in Venezuela who are who, who is considered the ruling class, traditional ruling class, and those who've been oppressed. Mm -hmm. Well, the the main parts of the ruling class in Venezuela, sort of traditional oligar oligarchy, are the business leaders and the media leaders, actually. Mm -hmm. in, you know, in Latin America, there are huge media conglomerates. And in Venezuela, the people who control those media conglomerates are very rich and very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so those are the people who would sort of have been the traditional elites, have been in the presidency before, um, and have put in place the policies that now Chavez is working to reverse. Clara, crime in Venezuela in the last 10 years have yes. nearly doubled. Yes. Can Chavez t tame it down and, and move forward? Is that a, a danger to his goals, the grand master plan? I mean, he's, he's very aware now, especially, you know, that the opposition is men mentioning that, you know, that the, mm -hmm. the main uh, problem for the Venezuelans are the question of security. Many people are killed, as of all, assassinations. I, I, I'm sure that he's going to take care of that, you know, it's, it's, it's very... Has important. he articulated a plan for crime reduction? Well, it's very much a problem of the cities, and it's something that if he is elected again, he's going to have to address. It's going to have to be part of his platform, because people in the cities really feel as though Chavez's Bolivarian revolution hasn't reached them the way that it's reached some of the, the rural side. people. Okay. And so that's why you saw the, uh, the, the city of Caracas go to the opposition. Some of the other big cities in, in Venezuela, Maracaibo, some of the other places, um, their municipal elections in the last election all went to the opposition, because okay. there is this real feeling in the cities that the sort of fruits of the Bolivarian revolution haven't come to people in terms of crime, security, housing, these real urban issues. So okay. if Chavez is going to win again, he's going to have to make those urban issues a part of his platform. Okay. Definitely. Let's switch back to foreign policy, U.S. policy towards uh, Venezuela. Now, we know how Chavez felt about Bush. It was a very <laughs> contentious relationship, to say the least. Um, where do we go from now? Will it, do you anticipate a better relationship with Obama? You know, the thing is, you know, something that I am in a certain way distressed.
Mm -hmm. But I was already saying things against Chavez. Mm -hmm. And I think in Latin America, we are, we are fed up of that. You know, this, let's, let's wait. This, I mean, they have to, I mean, Obama has to realize that it's a big change that we are going through. In, and, and don't confront so rapidly because mm -hmm. it's very bad. Right. And there are some good signs. You know, um, during the referendum, the State Department was very hands off. Okay. You know, the media was asking, and they'd have a press conference, the media would ask, What do you think about the referendum? And the State Department spokesperson said, That's an internal matter for Venezuela. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that never would have been said under the Bush administration. Good, and so afterwards, after the referendum, the State Department spokesperson came out and said um, that. Everything about the referendum was consistent with the with the process of democracy. democracy, and so it's a final admission that what's going on in Venezuela is actually democracy, which the Bush administration standpoint was very much that it was, you know, That's leaning fantastic. towards authoritarianism. I know that. Fantastic. Yeah, and so the, is there good. is some hope from yes. the State Department, but definitely yeah. some of the rhetoric from the Obama and from Obama himself yes. through the campaign and now very early in his presidency yes. has been problematic. But we'll see what happens when they. Theoretically, um, Obama and Chavez will meet at the Summit of the Americas in Trinidad in April, and that'll mm -hmm. be their first face-to-face -face meeting, or at least high-level people for them. And so we'll see what happens then. Carl, when they meet, if they do meet, do you expect any substantive uh, discussions to take place there? I don't know, because, you know, it's a, it's a big conference. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. But anyhow, the question to meet is, is important. To get together is important. And what should they talk about when they, when they get together? What are the main uh, issues? That, that well, obviously, the, the economic relationship between Venezuela and the United States is very close. But um, there, there are just these sort of questions of rhetoric and questions of intention that very, are very fraught in this relationship. And so I think that Clara's right, that it will very much be if they meet and they're seen in the same room and they shake hands and they make some pledge to cooperation, that will be a huge obstacle removed for U.S. relations with Latin America. Should Chavez tone down some of his rhetoric? All depends <laughs> on what Mrs. Obama, Mr. Obama will do, because he already, I, I read later something very strong from Chavez about a, the uh, State Department on human rights mm -hmm. that were very strong against Venezuela. And for instance, he said, why not did you put Israel into that uh, uh, report as well? And even he said, don't. I mean, no te metas con Venezuela. He said that, you know, very clear and very strongly. I'm very angry. Okay. Yes. Christy, you have the last word. What should be said? What should they, should they discuss? Well, they should absolutely discuss um, the idea that the nations of Latin America are sovereign nations and that they're free to make their own decisions. And um, there is no longer this sort of idea of a sphere of influence where the U.S. is the hegemonic power and the countries of Latin America have to do what they want. Obama has to come, and he said this, as a partner and as, a, as an equal partner to that kind of discussion. We'll have to leave it at that. Christy Thornton, Clara Ponce de Leon, thanks for joining us. Thank you, too. Now, here's Abby Ishola with some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some stories from the ethnic media. From the forward, Jewish members of the Park Slope Food Co-op are outraged by the company's proposed ban on products imported from Israel. The food co-op's ban would be the latest in a series of boycotts against Israeli products since the attacks in Gaza. The market is one of the few places where Jews in Brooklyn can purchase natural food at good rates. Indian Country Today reports that it and other native media were snubbed by the White House during an event addressing issues affecting their community. The event? Michelle Obama's announcement of White House plans to appoint a senior advisor to work with Native American tribes on health care, sovereignty, and education issues. From Washington Afro, historical black colleges are stumbling as a result of the economic crisis. Several well-known black universities, including Spelman and Morehouse College, are cutting jobs and reporting decreases in student enrollments. Black colleges that depend on tuition money rather than endowments are finding it especially hard to cope. From the Filipino Reporter, temporary workers in the U.S. are being recruited to work in Canada. The province of Alberta, Canada, has introduced a new immigration program that will allow American H-1B visa holders to work there. Applicants do not need a sponsor or a job offer from an employer to qualify. And finally, from Louisiana Weekly, Affluent ethnic consumers have become a primary target for luxury marketers. A new study by the research firm Diversity Affluence finds that black, Asian, and Hispanic Americans who earn at least $75,000 a year share over $200 billion in purchasing power. 
Economists have named the three groups the Royaltons. Those are just a few stories from the ethnic media. Back to you, Gary. Thanks, Abby. Stories of doom and gloom fill the pages of many ethnic and immigrant newspapers. From firings to foreclosures, the financial downturn has hit immigrant communities particularly hard. But recently, AM New York ran a piece about immigrants who are taking it all in stride. With me is the author of the article, Sheila Ann Feeney. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Recently, as we mentioned, you had this front page cover article, C'est la vie. Mm -hmm. Immigrants advised to New Yorkers who are suffering through the recession. Party on. Was that the intent of the article? I don't think the intent of the article was um, ignore the economic realities and party on. But I, and I wanted to note that the stories of doom and gloom also fill the pages of the mainstream press, not just the ethnic and the immigrant press. But what I was really struck by was that despite objective reality where immigrants were disproportionately hit hard by the current economic realities, that very often emotionally they seemed almost more resilient than Americans who had been here for generations. Why is that? Why do you think that's the case? I think there's a couple different reasons. One is I think a lot of uh, immigrants have stronger religiosity uh, values, stronger connections to their family. Also, uh, the professor who I quoted in the story, Michael Cohen, had mentioned that by the time immigrants get to the United States, they're a particularly hardy and resilient group. You know, if, you, if you're willing to uproot yourself from wherever you came from, learn a new language, and come to a new land and put in roots, you tend to be a pretty strong person. Well, is it perhaps because they're not used to having so much that we in America have been accustomed to lately, so now that they don't have it, they can deal with the reality? Absolutely. I think if you come from a land where you've already had currency devaluations, coups, even genocide, and you come to the United States, you have a completely different frame of reference so, uh, as to what is happiness. So yeah. losing your 401k plan doesn't bother you as much? No. If you still got your loved ones around you, you have a different frame of reference of what's really important in life. Was This is... What struck me about this article, I really like mm -hmm. it, it was counterintuitive. Uh, you don't often see immigrants portrayed that way, which is mm -hmm. a positive to the editors and to you uh, of AM New York. Oh, um, thank you. Was this something that was difficult to get into the paper? Um, I have to tell you, Gary, it, I wasn't even pitching to get it into the paper. The editor-in-chief of AM New York, Diane Goldie, is a friend of mine. And we were having lunch, and I was just telling her how struck I was by the difference in my group of friends, uh, you know, that the people I, who still have jobs, their marriages are good, their kids are happy, but they are obsessing over their 401ks, they cannot enjoy life, uh, who are multi-generational Americans. And I have immigrant friends who are objectively facing really difficult circumstances, and yet, you know, we go out salsa dancing or we're still enjoying our life. And they're still grateful for the things that are really important, you know, the health of their loved ones or whatever. And she was like, do a story on that, because she's sort of sick and tired of this just steady drumbeat of terrible things. Because life does go on. Life is, I think so many Americans define themselves by their bank accounts. And we're all so much bigger than that. And I think I noticed too, amongst a lot of my immigrant friends, you know, if you're a good husband or you're a good mom or a, a good sister, brother, that those ties really count for something too. You have more things to draw from in terms of your identity and that's so important. And I thought Americans really, or long-term Americans, multi-generational Americans, have a lot to learn from these other cultures. So. Were you worried that uh, there will be a backlash about this article that you were trying to uh uh, denigrant immigrants, that they were a party animal, if you will? Yes, I was. <laughs> yes, I was. Mm -hmm. um, I was really concerned about that. And the prof Professor Michael Cohen, who I interviewed in here, I think he was also concerned about that. Because we're not trying to say, like, oh, like, they're oblivious to reality or anything like that. What I tried to focus on was more emotional coping skills. And there's also a concept of relative happiness, you know, that we tend to compare ourselves to the people around us you know, rich, rich countries are generally, generally have higher happiness scores than poorer countries, but 
to be rich doesn't mean that you're happy. happy. And Certainly, we know mm -hmm. that. Money can't buy happiness. Money cannot buy happiness. So what was the uh, result? What was the reaction what was that you got from the article? Um, I didn't get a lot of negative response. I think people know that you put on a flashy headline and a sexy picture to get people to pick up the paper. I don't know if that influenced you at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she is attractive, so She's I don't know. Resi is very attractive, yes. <laughs> um, but, um, but the yeah but we didn't get a lot of people you know hating mm, the article you. or hate mail or anything now like we talked earlier about this 63 year old woman mm -hmm. that you interviewed had a mm -hmm. lot to say mm -hmm. but somehow she didn't make it into the paper was she her quote made it into the paper but, but her picture. picture was not in the paper was yeah. that telling in any way um i think that you have worked for newspapers yourself and i think you know that when Photo editors and photographers have um, choices to make. They, there is a bias in favor of youth. I've seen it in the media that I've worked for. And uh, I think also, you know, Rezi opened up her, I think it was her birthday party they shot. I'm not positive. But um, she had a party and they wanted something really lively and um, sparkly, I think, to put in the paper. One thing that struck me, I was kind of looking for some factory workers and, mm -hmm. and some... Uh, perhaps even some uh, deal worker to be mm -hmm. interviewed. Uh, did you have a hard time finding? Uh... Well, when you have a 400 word piece, you do not, and that was emphasized to me, you only have 400 words for um, a cover story. You can only put so much in. I mean, there was a lot more I wanted to explore from different, um, not only different countries, different people, but also different academic perspectives because there's just so much to say, but we couldn't, we couldn't cover absolutely every aspect. Well, then tell our viewers mm -hmm. some of the aspects, some of the things that you wanted to include in the article. You couldn't because... Well, I, um, I guess just to get more into that, the thing about identity and how people see themselves. And I also wouldn't say that like all immigrants respond this way. I'm sure there are immigrants that are absolutely and utterly miserable well, a lot over of the them, current... They yeah. have to send money back to relatives. Absolutely, and yes, so, and, yes, and and those those monies have been reduced. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Did you talk homelands. to some of these people uh, during your reporting? Um, I not during my reporting, but in my personal life, yes, I have, and I know people are sort of negotiating with their families at home and talking about you know we can't send as much as we used to, and so the people back home are hurting as well. So. Where do we where do we move from where do we go from from here? Uh, do you think that immigrants are going to continue with the same attitude, or you think there's going to be a shift in, in 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 the way they feel about the economic situation? Well, I don't know where any of us are going to go from here. I mean, who knows where the economic situation is going to go from here? And I think there's a lot of different individual variability. People respond differently, and. You know, I think we are all really, really hoping that things get better. But one thing I could point out, especially for some of the Europeans, they, they in a way, are better off than a lot of the longtime Americans because they're eligible for dual citizenship, right? So a lot of people are hedging their bets and saying, well, I'll get dual citizenship and then I can go back to the EU where you have socialized health care, you have access to all of these other things. And that's something that... Clearly, people in the other um, poor countries don't have, but in some ways, immigrants almost have an out where they figure, if I've got money saved here, I can go back and still live better than what I did before. We'll have to leave it at that. Okay. Sheila and Feeney, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be right back. You promised me the world. Is this what you had in mind? Help Earthshare and its members restore balance to the world. Visit earthshare.org and see what you can do. Earthshare, one environment, one simple way to care for it. We end our show with a story about a Zimbabwean immigrant who came to New York with a mission, literally, to work for the Salvation Army. Once here, he wanted a forum where the city's African immigrants could share views and get news from back home. But the free flow of information from Zimbabwe and many other African countries comes mainly via the web. So he created an internet radio station. Judy Escalona has more. Everybody has a story to tell. Yes, sir. Everybody who is listening to me to, today, I don't know why they are where they are right now, but they have 
a story to tell. Shaka Nguye's story begins in Zimbabwe and ends in New York City. A youth minister for the Salvation Army, Shaka is also the founder of SARFMRadio.com, a net radio station presenting African music and talk. The station also offers news from Africa uncensored and globally accessible. The Internet has become the medium for many African journalists to report the news freely. Sometimes it is, it is difficult for, for some of the journalists uh, from Africa to be involved in what we do here because they've got uh, you know, very difficult and very strange rules that they, they, that they have to abide you know, by. You know, so I'm talking about here in the diaspora, you know, how can we help our continent? How can we help to make sure news goes to everybody in Africa? Housed in the Salvation Army building in Harlem, SAR FM was created three years ago by Shaka as a tool for his ministry. Every week he holds Bible class, offline and online. According to Shaka, media is critical for reaching today's youth. Kids are going to church and they can be taught from the Bible, but guess what? You know, as soon as they're done with church, they're going back to the internet, they're going back to the computers, they're going back to the, uh, you know, TV. Shaka saw the need for a radio station that would represent the values of the growing African immigrant population of New York City. These immigrants are often turned off by mainstream radio. They like the music, they like hip-hop, they like the reggae, whatever, but the next programs are like demeaning women, calling the women the B word, the F that, and all those things. You know, Africans, a lot of Africans are not used to that. They don't like that. Today, one out of three black New Yorkers is foreign born. And while the city's African American population is decreasing, the African immigrant population is growing. When we started, we were thinking about Southern Africa only, like South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Botswana, Zambia. Namibia, you know, and then we realized that there was a vacuum for, for Africa, you know, so why should we limit ourselves to Southern Africa when, you know, the, the vacuum is for, for all Africans? So we incorporated the rest of our brothers and sisters. Pamela Stitch, who is from Nigeria, is the host of two talk shows, Lover's Lounge and African Gazebo. I came about two and a half years ago, three years ago, to CIFM. At that time, I didn't know of any other African radio station. And when I came here, I, I heard people talk about my issues, they talk about play the kind of music I was familiar with, mixing it with other, you know, music from other regions, you know. So it was, apart from being an ent entertainment factor, it was also one that informed, so, and educated me. Information and education conveyed through news, interviews, and song. Language can pose a problem. Most of the programs are in English with some French and Spanish. Music, however, is the real lingua franca. For Independent Sources, I'm Judith Escalona. That's our show. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. In the meantime, be independent minded.